Look at the second part of the section about uh, continuity. And mainly I'm just going over some lots of different example problems. The uh, first thing that is kind of the big uh, overarching concept that you want to have down is what are the three conditions that must uh, satisfy a function to be continuous at a point. So first of all, what we're going to say is f of x must be defined at x equals a, and a must be in the domain of f of x. Okay, condition number two is we have to say the limit as x approaches a of f of x must exist. And then the last uh, situation, limit x approaches a of f of x must be equal to the function value f of a. So that's a very important thing to make sure that you know the three conditions that uh, satisfy a, condition, a function being continuous at a point. Okay, next problem. Describe the points, if any, at which a rational function fails to be continuous. So a rational function is discontinuous at... Uh, x values, you could say it like this if you want to, x values where f of x is not defined. So you're really looking at a, de a, de a denominator, so where it's not defined. Okay, give an example of a rational function discontinuous at x equals 3. There's lots of examples that you could give on this. So if you wanted to have a polynomial that's discontinuous at x, at x equals 3, one way to do this uh, would be to have a, a zero denominator. You know, if x is equal to 3, you have a zero denominator. And it doesn't really matter what you put in top here. It's just some sort of a polynomial. So that would be a, an example. OK. Now, next thing, I give you a graph that says determine the points at which the following functions f have discontinuities. At each point of discontinuity, state the conditions in the continuity checklist that are violated. Okay, well, the first thing, let's start with point number one. The first place that we are going to be discontinuous is going to be at x equals one. Okay, and the reason for this is, is because the limit is not equal to the function value. Okay, you'll notice that at this particular point, you're going to have uh, f of 1 is equal to 3. Okay, but the problem is the limit. The limit does exist. It would be you have the limit as x approaches 1. The left-hand limit would approach 2. The right-hand limit would approach 2. So we'd say the limit of f of x, since it's equal to 2, is not going to be equal to f of 1. So the limit is not equal to the function value. Okay, second place would be clearly at x is equal to 2. So you'd be discontinuous at x equals 2. And in this case, the limit does not exist. The left-hand limit goes to 1. The right-hand limit goes to 2. So we would say the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x does not exist. That would be the condition that fails on the continuity with that one. And then the last place we have looks like x equals 3. Okay, so at x equals 3, the function's not defined. You have a bubble there. It's You don't have a dot anywhere, so it's not defined there. So we would say because f of 3 is not defined. Okay, so you kind of have uh, one of each condition on that checklist. Okay, all right. So moving down to number 12, I'm going to, and on the next page, um, the next two problems, I'm going to go ahead and have you pause the recording here for a minute and just go ahead and do number 12 yourself, and then you can check back and see if you got them right. Okay, so looking at this, um, the first place that you should, that should have located where you're discontinuous it's going to be at x equals 2. At x equals 2, you clearly have a break in the graph. And notice the right-hand limit goes to 2. The I'm sorry, the left-hand limit goes to 2. Right-hand limit goes to 4. So we would say the limit as x approaches 2 
of f of x does not exist. That's the reason why that is discontinuous at that point. Uh, the next place you have, of course, is the vertical asymptote. So you would have a vertical asymptote at x equals 3. So x equals 3, uh, again, what would happen on this is the function's undefined, okay? The, the limit, both the left and right-hand limit both go to negative infinity uh, on that. So uh, we would say the number one reason would be uh, f of 3 is not defined. And that would make it discontinuous. You have a asymptote there. Okay, then the next place we're going to look at uh, would be at um, the next point at x equals 4. So at x equals 4, what's going on? First of all, you are defined. Okay, you have, you're definitely defined there. The limit does exist. The left-hand limit goes to 4. The right-hand limit also goes to 4. But the limit does not have this, is not the same as the function value. So what you would say is the limit as x goes to 4 of f of x is not equal to f of 4. And notice on this that the limit has a value of 4, but f of 4 has a, y, has a value of 2. So that function value is up 2, but the limit approaches 4. So that would be the reason why. Okay, moving to the next situation here on uh, this next example, example 18. Uh, we're given a piecewise function. And um, we're going to kind of analyze the continuity of this. Now, without doing a graph, first of all, what this function, is, what the problem is really saying is it's saying if x isn't equal to 3, then you're in the first piece. But if x is equal to 3, that function value is 2. So what you have here is you have f of 3 is equal to 2. Now what we need to do is we need to do the limit as x approaches 3. That's kind of what we're interested in of the function that you're given which is x squared minus 4x plus 3 over x minus 3. Now there's some factoring that could go on. This looks uh, to me like it would be a 0 over 0 limit. So let's go ahead and let's factor that numerator. So the, fact, uh, the numerator is going to factor as x and x, 3 and 1, with a minus 3 and minus 1 to add up to get that negative 4. And then what happens is, one of them cancels out, so, and remember we learned that that means there's a hole at x equals 3. So we need to go ahead and do that limit now. So we need to go ahead and do the limit as x approaches 3 of what's left over. Now see, this is a linear function left over, so all you should have to do is just plug that in to get 3 minus 1 is equal to 2. And then here's the key thing. f of 3 is equal to 2, and the limit's equal to 2. So that's kind of the key thing we do on this. So as we're looking at the conditions on this, well, first of all, f of 2, or I'm sorry, f of 3 is equal to 2. So that means the function is defined. That's, of course, the first condition of continuity. So, you know, we're defined uh, at x equals 3. Okay, now we just did the limit. The limit we did over here, we got that to be 2. Therefore, we would say f of x uh, is continuous at x is equal to 3. Okay, and the reason for that is, again, the limit as x goes to 3 of the function was equal to f of 3. Okay, so we have f of 3 is 2, we have the limits 2, therefore that function is continuous. If you looked at this on a graphing calculator, uh, after you cross out this thing here, you would end up having a linear function, y equals x minus 1. So that's what I graphed here, is that's a y-intercept there, and then you have a slope of 1, and then what would happen, and let me zoom on this just for a second here so I can see this a little bit better. Okay, so you have a, again, you have a y-intercept right here uh, at the point 0, negative 1, and we've done a slope, you're going up 1 over 1, up 1 over 1, so that matches that slope equal 1. But what happens is you have a open bubble at 3. Okay, you're going to end up having an open bubble, and then you're going to notice on there that the left-hand limit goes to 2, the right-hand limit goes to 2. And what happens is, since, since you're redefining the point 3, 2, 
So you're giving them this second piece right here. Really all that does is just fills in the hole. So since it fills in the hole, then that's what ultimately makes that function continuous at that point. Okay. Okay, when you look at number 22 and analyze this, first of all, the first thing you got to notice is this is a rational function. And a rational function, again, is just a ratio of two polynomials. We generally say r of x equals like p of x over q of x, where p and q just represent polynomials. So we learned that a rational function is always continuous except where it has a zero denominator. So we'd have to figure out what makes this denominator equal to zero. So what we're going to do is at the side, let's just set that equal to zero and let's solve that and figure out what we get. Now this does not factor. So since that, since that won't factor, then you need to turn your attention over to the quadratic formula, which is x equals negative b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac <coughs> and all over 2a. Okay, in this problem, it goes like this. A would be 1, B would be 1, and C would be 1. So everything is equal to 1. Those are the coefficients of your terms. Of course, that's A, that's B, that's C in that order. So if we want, go through and plug this in, we're going to have X equals negative 1 plus or minus square root of 1 squared minus 4 times 1 times 1 all over 2 times 1. So that's going to give x equals negative 1 plus or minus, and see this is 1 minus 4 or negative 3 over 2. So what happens is you have an imaginary number there. So you end up with complex number situations, so you end up with x equals negative 1 plus or minus i root 3 over 2. So you have complex roots. Okay. So what we would say is g of x has complex roots on its denominator, therefore g of x is continuous everywhere. So there's no place it's undefined, so that means it's going to end up being all real numbers. Now when I put this in the graphing calculator, this is what comes out if you put this in. It's nice and smooth, there's no place it's undefined, so it's going to be continuous through all, all real numbers. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and move to 24. And I'll let you all go ahead and work on 24 yourself. Okay, first thing we want to do, we again have a rational function. So what your focus is, when you have a rational function, is where is this thing undefined? So we're going to go ahead and factor. I think it's real important that you go ahead and factor. <clears throat> the numerator factors, you're going to have x and x. You're going to have 3 times 1 to get 3 and then two minus signs to make that middle term add up to negative 4x. Uh, the denominator is a difference two squares, so you're going to have x plus 1 times x minus 1. Okay, so you're basically, you're undefined at two places. So we, we know for a fact that we're undefined <coughs> at x equals negative 1 and x equals 1. However, what we learned is the one that cancels out, that would be a whole. Okay, and then the one that's left over would be the vertical asymptote, okay? So what we would uh, find on this, it would be continuous um, at all places except these two places. So what we could say on this is S of X is continuous on the interval negative infinity to infinity. Well, hold on, not right there. We have to say like this. We'd have to break it up like this. We'd have to say it's continuous on the interval negative infinity to negative 1, union negative 1 to 1, and then uh, union 1 to infinity. So, but at x equals plus or minus 1, um, you're going to be discontinuous. Now, I think actually, now that I'm thinking about this, what I wanted you to fill in the blank here was not that. Um, you're, this is what I was after, okay? You're... S of X is continuous uh, everywhere on this function except at plus or minus 1. So that's what we're at. Okay, so I think this is what I intended. Okay, just like I said, S of X is continuous on negative infinity to negative 1, union negative 1 to 1, union 1 to infinity. So it's continuous everywhere except 
where it's undefined. So there's two things. We would say at x equals negative 1, discontinuity, we'd have what we call an infinite discontinuity. And then the other thing I wanted to mention is x equals 1, uh, the discontinuity is what we call removable. Okay, we have, basically we have a hole in that. So that's the idea. Now if you put this in your graphing calculator, which I had here, uh, one of the things that you would find is you would have a vertical asymptote at negative 1, like we predicted. And you can put this in your calculator if you want to, like this. And then at um, x equals three, uh, negative 1, at, at 1, you'd have a hole. So you'd end up having a hole kind of right in there, like that, if you put that in. I'm going to put it in my calculator and show you a couple things. So let me bring up the calculator, and this is this is how you would put this in, like this. And we'll just do this in a standard window, like this. So I'm just going to go zoom 6. And uh, you'll get the same kind of thing here. Now the asymptote's not going to come up on my TI-84, but it's definitely there. If you went through and looked at um, your, ta your table, so like if you went second graph and looked at your table of values, You'll, you'll find the two places where you have an error. So you have an error at negative 1 and 1. Those are the two places that it's undefined. Now one thing I wanted to show you on this too is if we traced real close to the hole, the hole is at 1. So if I just traced at like 0.99, something that's real close to 1, uh, that would be getting close to negative 1. So that hole would be close to, uh, it would be approaching, the function would be approaching negative 1 as it approached that hole like that. So that's just one thing I wanted to show you. Okay, so now if we move to the uh, next page here, again, I'm going to look at a, another rational function on this one. <clears throat> so uh, as I'm going through this one, again, we're going to look at the graph, and it's probably important that you go ahead and, 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 graph, and uh, factor this. So the numerator doesn't factor, but the denominator is a difference of two squares. So it'll factor as t plus 2, t minus 2. And again, what you have on this is you, you're undefined at two places. So you're undefined at t equals plus or minus 2. Okay, But the one that cancels is where you have that removable discontinuity. So you would end up having a hole at, x e at t equals 2. And then you would have a vertical asymptote. Oh, I crossed the wrong thing out. I need to be careful with my vision here. So let me do that again. Sorry about that. So I have t plus 2 over t plus 2, t minus 2. So again, what happens is the one that cancels is the hole. So we'd have a hole at negative 2. Then we'd have a vertical asymptote at the one that's left over. So that would be at t equals 2. Okay, so we would be continuous. We would say that f of t is continuous everywhere except plus or minus 2. So it would be on the interval negative infinity to negative 2, union, negative 2 to 2, union 2 to infinity. So it's everywhere except those two places. And if you looked at this on a graphing calculator, you can see kind of what we predicted we would get as you have that vertical asymptote at t equals 2, and then you would have the hole right there. So it would have that hole at t equals negative 2. Okay, now if we did, if we worked out this limit, I'll show you a couple things on this. So if we do the limit of, uh, of t plus 2 over t squared minus 4, as t approaches the hole, the hole's at negative 2. Well, if you factored like I showed you, if we go through and factor t plus 2, and then we have t plus 2, t minus 2, after the cancellation, then we can go ahead and evaluate the limit, and that will tell you what the limit is around that hole. So that would be the limit of 1 over t minus 2 as t approaches negative 2. So that would be 1 over negative 2 minus 2, so that would be negative 1 fourth. So this hole right here, you can kind of see the y value is going to be negative 4. The left-hand limit, right-hand limit are both going to negative 4. So we would say uh, there's two types of discontinuities on this. So uh, at t equals negative 2, the discontinuity is removable because you have the hole, and then we could say t equals 2, the discontinuity 
is infinite since you have that uh, vertical asymptote like that. Okay, now we're going to look at some limits of composition and try to reason these out independently of, of graphing with technology. And one thing that comes in real useful on these problems is uh, is the idea, whoops, the, uh, you're going to end up having uh, limit theorems that you can use. So that's what I'm going to do on problem 28. Now, anytime we have a limit of a function to a power, then one thing we learned is that we can do the limit of the function, which would just be 3 over this. Now, we could factor, I think, that 2 out of there and see what happens. So if we factored that out, we'd have uh, x to the fifth minus 2x to the second minus 25, which probably wouldn't do us any good anyway, and then take that whole limit uh, to the fourth power. Okay, so we're just going to focus on that limit for a few minutes here. The limit of the function 3 over 2x to the fifth minus 2x squared minus 25, the whole thing to the fourth power. So what we could do and you got to write this more like this. I'm not writing that correctly. It's the whole entire limit as uh, x approaches 2 to the fourth power. So that's what we're going to look at. So what I'm going to do is it, it doesn't appear that that denominator factors in any way. Um, so let's just go ahead and plug in the 2 and let's see what we get. We might end up getting a value on that. So uh, if this is a rational function that's defined at 2, then all we should have to do is is just do this. So let's do 2 times 2 to the 5th minus 2 times 2 to the 2nd minus 25. We'll work out the details of that and we're going to take that to the 4th power. So that's going to be 3 over and uh, we can go ahead and calculate, you know, do some of this. I'm going to just do this at the side of the paper here. So we have 2 times 2 to the 5th minus 2 times 2 to the 2nd minus 25. So that's going to be 2 times 32 minus 2 times 4 minus 25. So that's going to be 64 minus 8 minus 25. So 64 minus 8 is um, 56. And then 56 minus 25 is going to be 31. So it looks like we'd have 3 over 31 to the fourth power if I've done all the arithmetic correct. <clears throat> Okay, let me get this arithmetic down. I swear sometimes I go through calculus problems and I can do everything right except I screw up on the arithmetic. That's kind of a problem I have because I get going too fast. Okay, so really I didn't need to do that. Okay, God, look at all the time I'm wasting on doing arithmetic. <laughs> oh, well. Okay, so um, probably shouldn't even bother taking that two out. Doesn't factor anyway. Okay, so... If I do this, I've got 32 minus 8, which is 24 minus 25, so that's negative 1. So now I think I'm correct. Okay, so I've got 2 times negative 1. So that's 3 over negative 2 to the 4th. And if I multiplied that out, 3 to the 4th is 81, 2 to the 4th is 16. So it looks like the value of that limit would be uh, 81 over 16 then. Okay, so that should be our final result, is that. Okay, now the, uh, the next problem, uh, we're going to again appeal to limit theorems when we do this. So again, we have a limit of a function to the third power. So let's write this carefully as the limit as x goes to infinity of 2x plus 1 over x and the whole thing to the third power. Okay, just kind of focusing on this limit right here and what we know and what, what we've learned about infinite limits on here will come in handy. So the thing is, if you look at 2x plus 1 over x, okay, the degree of the numerator, which is 1, is equal to the degree of the denominator, uh, which is also 1. Okay, so that means you would have a horizontal asymptote at y equals 2 over 1. And again, what you learned uh, in this was these coefficients right here give you that asymptote. So we'd have y equals 2 over 1. So what that means is this, as x goes to infinity, you're going to approach that asymptote. 
So what you would have as an answer to this is you would have the, the value of that limits two, and then two to the third is equal to eight, like that, okay? So that answer to that problem would end up being eight. You could look at this on a graphing calculator, and I think it would clarify that just fine if you did that then. Okay, moving to the next problem. Okay, got a piecewise function that we want to consider. Okay, so if we look at uh, this example, this is a piecewise function, so the first thing that you would notice is we have two polynomials. Uh, the upper piece is a polynomial, and that's a polynomial. So it would be continuous everywhere. The only potential place would be that it wouldn't be continuous at zero because perhaps there's a break in the graph there. So really, all you'd want to do is this. This, this one is coming from the left-hand side. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a left-hand limit on this. So I'm going to do a limit as uh, x approaches 0 from the left of x cubed plus 4x plus 1. Now this is a polynomial function, so it's defined everywhere. So you can just plug that in and you would get 0 to the third plus 4 times 0 plus 1. So that would be equal to 1. So that left-hand limit is going to be equal to 1. Then you would take the second function, since it's defined for numbers larger than 0, we would go ahead and do a right-hand limit uh, of 2x to the third. So again, that's defined everywhere. It's a polynomial, so you just plug it in. So you get this. So what you can see is the left and right-hand limit at 0 don't approach the same value. So it would not be continuous at 0 for that reason. So remember, the limit, if we did a two-sided limit, if we did the limit as x approaches 0 of f of x, then it would not exist. Okay, so what we would say then is uh, if we looked at this function, okay, well, it would be at zero, what you would have is um, since you're equal to zero right here, and that's the key, is you're equal to zero. So what would be happening on that is you would be left continuous at x equals zero. For that reason, okay, because you really what you have is you have a solid dot there and you have an open bubble there, okay, so that's where it would be left continuous, okay, and then this is how the graph goes. Now I, I'm going to pull up my calculator. This again is how you would put this in. I'm going to just kind of put this on here for future reference on here. So again, the way that you put piecewise functions in your calculator is like this, and uh, you would end up having a graph that looks like this on your calculator. Um, but you don't really have the graphic to figure out whether it's continuous at zero. You just look at those two limits and see if they go to the same place. And then if we were looking at this, the, if we're going to state the interval of continuity, what we would say on this particular problem is we would say f of x is continuous everywhere except zero. So it, we'd say that it's continuous on the interval negative infinity to zero, union zero to infinity like that. Okay. Okay, let's see, the next one we're going to look at left continuity um, at, and right continuity at the endpoints. So let's go ahead and do that. So first of all, to kind of do this one without a lot of reliance on a calculator, uh, let's go ahead and let's find the x-intercepts. And, and you have a, a, a domain issue here. So one of the things I want to use this as an example of, if you were going to find the domain of this function, the idea is it's okay to have a square root of a positive. That's okay. It's okay to have a square root of, a, of zero, but it's not okay to have a square root of a negative. So if you wanted to figure out the domain on this problem, you would do x to the fourth minus one, and you would set it greater than or equal to zero. Now, what you have to do is you have to set up a sign chart to do this then. So you, the first thing you'd have to do is you would have to set x to the fourth minus one equals zero, and find ways to break up your sign chart. So this is a difference of two squares. So you would factor as x squared and x squared, one and one, with a plus and minus. Okay, this one is going to give complex solutions. If you, if you solved this equation right there, you'd get x squared equals negative one, so you get complex numbers. So we're not going to consider that. However, this one you would have uh, x squared minus 1 equals 0, so you'd have x squared equals 1, 
And if you square root both sides, you'd have x equals plus or minus 1. So the way that you can go about doing a sign chart, just, just for review mostly on, on this problem, is if you wanted to find the domain of this function uh, without relying on a calculator, you'd just do this. You would just look at negative 1, and you'd look at 1. Okay, that's the, those are the areas of interest on this. And then you could take test points. And, they, and you can just plug into x to the fourth minus 1. You can just go back to the original form on that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick test points. For instance, let's take a number that's less than negative 1, like negative 2, and plug it in. So you'd have negative 2 to the fourth minus 1, 16 minus 1. Well, that's a positive number, so that means that's okay. You would have a positive under a radical. Pick a, a point between negative 1 and 1. 0 is a good choice. So if you did 0 to the fourth minus 1, you get negative 1, so that's not okay. And then if you went with a number bigger than 1, and it doesn't matter what you choose, it'll always work the same way, then you'd have 2 to the 4th minus 1, 16 minus 1 as a positive, so that's okay. So what you'd end up having on this is your domain would be, graphically speaking, uh, would look like this. Okay, so you would end up having, you're okay at negative 1 and to the left. You're okay at 1 and to the right like that. So that would be what your domain on that problem is then. Okay, so what you would end up having uh, with this problem then is if you're considering the continuity, you would have to be looking at these two intervals right here. So what you would conclude based on this sign chart is we would have to conclude that we are uh, left continuous uh, on the interval negative infinity to negative 1, okay, because if we're coming from the left, we'd be in this region that's defined, and then we would be right continuous, because if the, the function is defined to the right of 1, so we'd say that we're right continuous on the interval 1 to infinity. Now that's a way to reason that problem out without technology. I want to go ahead and put this on the calculator and show you what it looks like uh, next here, so I'm going to pull my calculator up here, and this one's pretty easy to enter, and we'll just do this in a standard window, I guess. Uh, so what we'd have is we just do the square root of x to the fourth, and then minus 1, and you should have a graph that reflects pretty well what this sign chart shows. So if I just go zoom 6, what you want to notice on this is you should be defined to the left of negative 1 and then to the right of 1. You have this gap here because you're undefined, just like the sign chart said. So you would be left continuous on that interval and then right continuous on that interval then. Okay? So I'm going to just put this graph here for reference, and then that pretty well would verify what we figured out uh, just by hand. Okay? Okay, now this next problem... We're going to do a very similar thing on this. Now I'm going to I'm going to write this as like this. This could be written as f of z equals the fourth root of z minus one to the third. So we got to figure out you know what we have going on in this problem. The thing that we have going on is you can take a fourth root of a positive number and that's okay. The fourth root of zero is okay, but what's not okay is the fourth root of a negative number, because you can't take a negative number, raise it to the fourth, and ever get a positive. That's impossible. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take what's under that radical, and I'm going to set that equal to zero. So I've got uh, z, z minus one is equal to zero to the third power. Now if I cube root both sides, like this, you just get z minus 1 equals 0, or z is equal to 1. So I'm going to do a sign chart to analyze the signs, just like I did on the last problem. But this time, all i got to do is just consider one place. So I've got uh, z equals 1, and we're going to do test points and see what happens. So we're really plugging into the fourth root of z minus 1 to the third in both uh, regions, to see where we're defined and see what the domain is. Okay, so if we were to take a test point to the left of one like zero and plug it in, you would have 
fourth root of 0 minus 1 would be negative 1 to the third, but that would be the fourth root of negative 1, so that's not okay. So you can't take a fourth root of, um, of a negative number. Okay, now if you go out here and put in like, say, 2, then you would get the fourth root of 2 minus 1 to the third. That's okay because you're going to have a 1 to the third or 1. See, that's going to be fine if you do it that way. So what's happening on this problem then is really your domain is going to go from 1 to infinity like that. So what this means is we would draw the conclusion, since the function is defined to the right of that, we would say that this is right continuous on the interval 1 to infinity. So that would be the, the final answer of that problem then. Okay, and that's how you do that without a graphing calculator. Now I will put this in the graphing calculator next to show you how you would do that and how it would look. So all I'm going to do is just put in uh, x, i oh, got to clear everything off first, let's put in x, okay, calculator freezes on me lots of times on this computer, so I'm going to put in x uh, minus 1, uh, close parentheses, and I'm going to raise that to the 3 fourths power, and then we'll do this in a standard window. And then you should see that the function is defined on the interval uh, 1 to x, like that. So see, we, you can analyze things, and that's what you want to know how to do, because you want to understand how functions work. If you put them in your calculator and don't think about anything, then you're really not using your brain the way I want you to do. You're just using technology. So you want to understand why the graph looks the way it does. So you can tell pretty clearly on that one that... Um, that that would be right continuous. So this is the graph for 46, and the graph above is 42 like that. Okay, now let's go to the, the next one here, and let's look at that for a minute. Okay, so we have kind of an interesting function on, uh, on this one. We're looking at f of x equals e to the square root of x. So what you need to focus on is this, okay? What kind of numbers can x be? So this one's pretty easy to do in your head. x has to be greater than or equal to 0 because you have to have either a positive or 0 under the radical. What you can't have is the negative under the radical, so you would have that. So f is defined uh, on the interval, bracket 0 to infinity, and it is always continuous there. Okay, and that's because if you do a square root function, a square root function, if you do a square root of a positive number, you're always going to get an answer. There's no place once you get to zero and beyond where that's undefined. Okay, so uh, that would be the first thing you want. Okay, so the, the next thing we're going to look at is just what these limits are. And uh, so we know that we're continuous from uh, zero to infinity on that. Okay, we have an exponential function. The key thing is, as long as x is 0 or bigger, you're going to have e to a po positive power, and it's going to be defined. So what we can do on this is we can just evaluate the limit of f of x equals 4. So we're really doing the limit as x goes to 4 of e to the square root of x. So we just plug this in and evaluate that. That would be e to the square root of 4. So that would be e to the second. Okay. And then if we want to do the right-hand limit, um, as x goes to 0 from the right-hand side of e to the square root of x, well, we know that we're defined on the right of that. Okay, so we have our, so we're going to have a right-hand limit because uh, we're going to be continuous to the right because we're defined to the right of 0. So all we should have to do is just plug that in. We get e to the 0 power, which is equal to 1. <coughs> so that's what you'd have. And I think what I'm getting on this is we would say that it's um, <clears throat> we would say it's right continuous, but we would say it's uh, not left continuous <clears throat> at x equals zero. Uh, x equals zero. The reason being because f of x is not defined to the left of x equals 0. So that would be the idea. 
Okay, now let's take a look at the next one. So in a problem like this, again, limit theorems come in handy so often when you're working with these problems. So uh, if we're going to do the limit, and we're, we're interested in finding the limit, the left-hand limit uh, of the function ln of x over inverse sine of x. So there's two things you have to understand on this problem. First of all, if you have ln x, if that's your function, okay, the domain of ln of x is going to end up being 0 to infinity. Okay, the thing about this is, is you cannot take a log of zero. That's undefined. And the ln of a negative number is also undefined. And let me review why that is. It's actually very easy to show that. That natural logarithm is a log base e. So if you were doing the log base e of zero, and if you just set that equal to some variable x, you would get an exponential form, e to the x equals zero. And that's impossible. Anytime you take a positive number, which e is, to any power, you always get a positive number. e to the x is always greater than zero. Okay, so that's why that's not defined. It's impossible. Uh, same thing would happen on this. If you did the log base e of negative one, if you set that equal to x, you'd have e to the x equals negative one. That's impossible, again, because anytime you take a number to a power, you get a positive number. And just think about that. I mean, if you do uh, 2 to the 0 is 1. See, that's a positive number. 2 to the negative 1 is 1 over 2. That's positive. 2 to the negative 10 is 1 over 2 to the 10. It's still positive. So that's why the domain of a natural logarithm is this. Okay, so that's a fairly important thing to look at. Then the other thing you got to remember from trig is if you have inverse sine of x, Okay, that's defined defined on this interval. That is defined on uh, from negative 1 to 1 is your domain. And then its range is negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Okay, so what's going to happen on this one is we are within the range on here. So if we're doing a limit as x goes to 1, okay, we're within the domain of the sine. We're at the end of the domain of the inverse sine. And we're clearly within within this, okay? So that means that we could go ahead and we could crunch out that limit. Uh, the problem with this is the left-hand limit, uh, you couldn't do a right-hand limit because the inverse sine is only defined here. So you couldn't come from the right of 1, but you can come from the left of it. Okay, so we should be okay to just plug in the value on this then and do this from the, from the left. So we would be doing the ln of 1, over the inverse sine of 1, and then working that out. Okay, well, the ln of 1, if you kind of look at this, the ln of 1 is equal to 0 because e to the 0 is equal to 1. So that's 1. And then you would have to kind of look at a, a unit circle on an inverse sine, okay, or, or you can just kind of reason this out. What you're doing on this is you're trying to find the angle that has a sine equal to 1. So basically, if you look at this point, 0, 1, okay, that's where the sine is equal to 1. Now, when you're doing an inverse sine, you are giving me the angle. So you're looking for an angle. So that angle there is pi over 2. So then that would turn out to be pi over 2. So you have the reciprocal of pi over 2. So that's 2 over pi would then be the solution to that problem. Okay, that's another good one to look at on a calculator. So I'm going to go ahead and pull up my calculator and show you kind of what I analyzed on this. Since we're dealing with a trig function, you'd make sure that you're in radian mode. And then uh, you would put in uh, ln of x in your numerator. Okay, like that. Then you divide by, and you'd have to go second sign to get the inverse to come up of one like that. And what we're going to do is we're going to graph this um, now let's graph it in a standard window because I think you'll probably see everything okay. Um, so like I was saying on here, see we're only defined to the left of that negative 1. We don't have a graph out here because the inverse sine's domain. So that's the, that's the number one reason for that. So if I, if I look at just a couple other things with you on this, uh, with this graph, and let me move this down here just a tad bit. Okay, and label that as 
problem 54, okay, again, just like we expected, okay, you, you basically know a these two things when you put it together. The domain of an inverse sine is negative 1 to 1, but the domain of an ln is 0 to infinity. So if you put that together, you're going to notice that your graph only went from uh, 0 to 1. Now it included 1 like that, and that's it. That's what came out. So that's why you could, that's why you could do a left-hand limit. So you would say you're left continuous on that interval. Okay. So I'm just going to add this to this. You would be left continuous on the interval 0 to 1. And remember, the natural logarithm cannot be 0. The inverse sine can. The inverse sine can be 1, but it can't be bigger. And then the ln can also be 1. So that's why you would include that endpoint 1 like that. Okay, that's a good problem. Okay, then the, the next thing I want to look at is uh, another piecewise function. This says determine the intervals of continuity for the parking cost function. Uh, and this is the function we got here. So you have breaks in this. So basically, the discontinuities continuities would occur where these breaks are. So they would go right through these regions right here. These would be the places where the limit would not exist. Okay, so we're considering the interval 0 to 60, including 0 and 60. So what we would say is if we wanted to name the intervals it's continuous on, okay, the first thing is we're going to be continuous from 0 to 15. And then the key thing is don't include 0, you have a bubble, but do include, include 15. Then you move to the next thing, which is 15 to 30. Do not include 15, do include 30. And then you jump to the next thing, 30 to 45, same idea, do not include 30, do include 45. And then the next thing would be 45 to 60 with the same pattern like that. So that would be where it's continuous, that's how you would write that. So by putting those parentheses there, um, you would be basically telling us then that we are not continuous, you're basically discontinuous at 15, we're actually at 0, 15, uh, 30, uh, 45, uh, like that. So those would be the places where you have the jumps in the graph then. And actually, I just, I just found a real uh, an important mistake here. You know, actually, I'm... I, I'm was thinking I was looking at left continuous on that, but that's you were looking at the direction said continuous. So you basically got to do this. Because you have breaks everywhere, Okay, you, you would be discontinuous at 15. So you can't put a, a bracket on 15 because you're discontinuous there. Same thing with 30 and 45. Okay. Now since the graph comes to an end at 60, you can go ahead and you can put a bracket around that just because that comes to an end there. That's the end of it right there. And then you would uh, you could consider the left continuous on those intervals like that. Okay, now the next thing is just some key, kind of key definitions that we looked at. Uh, we looked at classifying the discontinuities. We looked at a removable discontinuity. Uh, those are two possibilities. We looked at a jump discontinuity. The limit doesn't exist. And where you have like a vertical asymptote has an infinite discontinuity. So we're going to look at showing that this function has a removable discontinuity at the given point. So uh, the first thing we're going to look at is this function right here. x is not equal to 1, you're on that function. If x is equal to 1, you have that point. So what we're really saying on this is we're saying that g of 1 is equal to 3. That's a point on the graph. You just have a point uh, 1, 3. x is 1, y is 3. Now if we consider this function, x squared minus 1 over 1 minus x, now let's work with this algebraically. Uh, the numerator factors is a difference of two squares, and then the denominator, you can kind of reverse that you can put a negative one in front of it like that. That way you don't change it. If you're not familiar with that, convince yourself of why that's right. If you do a distributed property, so you're going to get negative x plus 1, which is the same as 1 minus x. 
Okay, now what's gonna happen is then you're gonna have that hole or that removable discontinuity at x equals one, okay? So that would be the idea. The other thing is you gotta make sure that, you gotta do the limit, okay? You know you've got a hole there, but the question is, would this point, would that fill in the hole? So you're kind of asking yourself, okay, is this going to fill in the hole and make us continuous at that point? So what you're going to do is you're going to do the limit as x approaches 1. We're interested in that hole right there. And let's just do what's left over. You would end up just looking at this function there, which is really, you can just write this as negative x plus 1 like that. And that's a line, that's a linear function, so you're okay to just plug in and evaluate, so that would be negative one plus one, so that would be negative two. So what we have is we have the limit as x goes to one of g of x is equal to negative two. And you wanna notice that g of one is equal to three, so since they are two different values, we would say that, we are, that we're discontinuous at that point, we would be discontinuous at x equals 1, and it would be removable because of what I just showed. We just showed that the limit is not equal to the function value. And if you look at these diagrams up here, that's kind of what, you kind of have this situation right here. You have a limit that exists, but it's not equal to the function value. So that's how you would show that ha that has a removable discontinuity. Okay, and let's look at some, a few other limits. Okay, so on the, the next thing, we're looking at some trigonometric functions and looking at their limits. Uh, one of the things I wanted to show you on this one, first of all, and I brought up a unit circle on this, if you look at phi pi over two, you know, hopefully you remember that pi radians is equal to 180 degrees. So if you did five times 180 over two, 180 over two is 90, so this is really 450 degrees which of course means from trig, it means you know one lap is 360, then you would go 90 more. So you're at this, this point right here. So we're gonna be kind of considering that point and what's happening to that limit. The first thing I wanna show you on this, if we just plug this in, and if we did the sine of five pi over two, squared it, plus six sine of five pi over two, plus five, and then did the denominator the same way if we did the sine of uh, five pi over two squared minus one. Okay, well, if you went there and looked at this limit, you would end up having, we know that the sine is the y value. So if we're doing the sine of five pi over two, that's just gonna be equal to one. So you would end up having one squared plus six times one plus five over 1 minus 1, uh, like that. So it looks like you have a, a defined a numerator right there, but then you have 0 there. So it looks like your, your function's undefined there is what the problem is. And even if you went through and evaluated this limit, now it looks like we could do some factoring on there because this looks like this is just going to be 12 over 0. So you're, you can tell that the function's undefined at phi pi over two. Now, if you went through and factored this, let me show you what would happen if you did that, because the numerator does factor. That's gonna be sine x plus five, and it's gonna be sine x plus one. Okay, if you factor that, then the denominator is a difference of two squares, so it's gonna factor as sine x plus one uh, and sine x minus one. Well, you're gonna have that cancellation there like that, but you're interested in uh, what's going on at five pi over two. So you would be undefined there. So we would uh, eventually, we would just say that the limit does not exist at that point. Okay, so you're gonna be undefined there. So there's gonna be something going on at that particular point. Okay, so I'm gonna look at this one on a graphing calculator also to kind of help you to see why it would not exist. Okay, so I pulled my calculator up, and I and I put this in, the graphing calculator. Um, and if I graph this, I'll show you what window I did the, the graphing on this. I did this from 0 to 3 pi by a scale of pi over 2 from negative 100 to 100. 
So I'm going to slide that over there. Then I'm going to slide my graph over here so I can write on it and we can kind of talk about what's going on on this problem then. So let's see, I got, got the graph here and I got the, put the viewing window over here. So uh, just so we can um, make a few notes to ourselves on this. Okay, so here's my graph, here's my viewing window. Come on, get over there. Okay, so what I did on my, on my viewing window, what I did was I did zero to three pi, scaled by pi over two. That way five pi over two fits in there, and then I did this. So what this is doing is this is pi over two, this is pi, three pi over two, uh, two pi, five pi over two is here, and that's what we're considering, so you can pretty clearly see that we had a vertical asymptote. The function's not defined there, uh, so therefore the limit would not exist, okay? Now the next one I want to look at is, is this one, and just sort of analyze how this would go if you're looking at infinity. So again, I'm going to look at the, uh, the limits, the limit theorems. I'm going to appeal to the limit theorem, so I have the limit as t goes to infinity of cosine t, and then we're going to divide that by the limit as t goes to infinity of e to the 3t. Okay, well what's going to happen on the limit as t goes to infinity is it's unpredictable. The, co the cosine, really this numerator, if you think about this numerator, the function val values are going to vary from negative 1 to 1. The range of a cosine is negative 1 to 1. So you're going to have some sort of a constant value varying from negative 1 to 1. And then if you look at this, if you look at e to the 3t, well that's just going to be larger and larger. So what's going to happen if you go and plug in an infinitely large number, that's just going to approach infinity. So what's going to happen is you're going to end up sort of having this structure where you have a constant over infinity. And anytime you have a constant over infinity, you're going to approach zero. So you could reason out that the value of that limit would be zero as t goes to zero because the numerator varies is a constant. And then the denominator is infinity, so that would go like that. Okay, so I'll pull this one up also on the calculator just so that you can see this. So if I erase what I've got in the last problem, and if I put in cosine of x, like this, then divide by the exponential, uh, e to the x, like this. And if I just graph, I'm going to go back to graphing this on a standard window, just so we can kind of visually see what's going on on this problem. And I may have to adjust the window on this so it looks a little better. Okay. So we're kind of interested in what's happening as t goes to infinity. So one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, I'm going to just go from 0 to 10. And then for the y's, I'm going to go from, oh, let's just say something like negative 1 to 2 by a scale of 1. So let's just look at that and just kind of consider that. We're only interested in, in how the graph behaves at infinity anyway. So I want you to see how this graph is just leveling off at zero. Okay, so you're just going to get closer and closer to zero, but you're never going to approach zero. So that would be roughly what you would end up having on that type of a graph like this. Okay, so I'm just going to squeeze this in here, and that would be the graph of number 78. Okay, and then this is the graph of number 72. So that's how you would analyze both of those things independently of a calculator, then checking with a calculator. Okay, now we'll look at this uh, last. Okay, so what I wanted to first of all do is just put this in your calculator. You have sine x over x, put in like that. We were going to set up a viewing window as said here. We're going from negative pi to pi on the x. And then I decided to do a scale of pi over 4. And then the y going 0 to 2 by a scale of 1. And then if we do the graph, you should end up with this graph like this. So I'm going to slide two things over here. I'm going to put my uh, window over here and my graph over here so we can kind of look at these two things and have these as a point of reference as I'm going through this problem then. Okay, so one of the things is... Uh, 
inaccuracies in the graph. One thing would be here. So if you have, if you're looking at the function like we're looking at, f of x equals sine x over x. Okay, well, first thing is we're undefined at x equals 0. So the, the bubble doesn't really come up on there, but it's there. So you have some sort of a bubble there. So that would be one of the inaccuracies of that graph then. So it kind of looks like the function will be defined throughout that interval. One of the things you're going to find on this is the sine of x is always defined. So that numerator is always defined, whereas the entire function is undefined at x equals 0. So you're going to be defined everywhere except x equals 0. So it looks like at first glance that you might be defined everywhere, but you're not. You're going to have a hole at 0. So the function is not defined at x equals 0, like that. So we would conclude then, is the function continuous at 0? No, it's, it's not continuous at 0, even though the graphing calculator may appear that way. OK, so that would be the last thing I want to look at on that. And then this will finish this up. So hopefully this will give you some good understanding of uh, continuity and lots of examples that will help you with.